talk a lot about uh, the idea of uh, Jewish identity, whether that is racist at one end, a little softer, whether it's inherently discriminatory. ACRI, your group, works a lot for the elimination of discrimination. Tell us a little bit about how you do that. Discrimination in Israel, in a way that's directly tied to the issue that we've just discussed before, is often expressed directly with regard to the rights of the Arab minority in Israel, in a country where one in five citizens uh, is Palestinian, is, is Arab Israeli. And one of the key issues in which that fight expresses itself is in the context of access to, to land and housing, uh, an issue that's been front and center uh, for all Israelis, well, basically since, uh, since 1948. About 20 years ago, uh, we won one of our most celebrated cases, uh, the Kaadam case, the Katsil case, some of you may, may have heard about that. One of the most important Supreme Court cases in Acre's history, I think in the, in the country's history. Because until then, until the Kaadam case, one of the mechanisms of discrimination was that the state would wash its hands from discrimination that would happen on state land if that discrimination happened by a third entity. I think it was the Jewish agency in that, in that case. So since most land in Israel is owned by the state and only leased out for extensive periods, and, and theoretically we should be in a situation where land would be used in an indiscriminatory manner, what the state would do was to give someone else the land to develop it and to build, and then they would just develop it for the sake of one part of the population, typically just to build a Jewish village. And again, just to be absolutely clear, talking about issues that are, we're talking about within Israel proper, within the Green Line, that that would happen. And in the Kaadam case, in that historical victory, the High Court said that the past belongs to the past, a new page opens, and that would no longer be legal uh, or possible in the state of Israel. Let's talk again about housing in the context of the tent protests of two summers ago when trendy Rothschild Boulevard in Tel Aviv was transformed into a sea of nylon and zippers. What has come of the tent protests? In, in many ways, the protests has achieved everything and nothing at the same time. It has achieved everything in the context of changing the discourse. And the fact that people are now discussing front and center issues of affordable housing and the non-further privatization of healthcare in Israel and the quality of welfare services, and the quality of education, and so on. The fact that that conversation has moved from you know, page 17 to page one headlines, and that people are paying close attention to OECD statistics, for instance, it's really nice to be amongst that club of 30-something most developed nations. It's not so nice to be consistently number 29 out of 33 and you would be appalled by the growing statistics that demonstrate gaps in the quality of health care between one town and a different town in Israel. Not a huge country. How come such gaps can develop across such a small geographical state? And when you see that those gaps translate also in different life expectancies, gaps up to a decade's difference in the life expectancy between one city and another, then you demand change and you demand answers. And this is where the protest has achieved so far so little. Because for this to change, policies need to change and legislation needs to be passed. And of that, we have seen close to nothing so far.